Hey, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, Novik Talks. Uh, we have two really exciting speakers today, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Just uh, as uh, a refresher, a few ground rules. You should be automatically muted upon entering the uh, Zoom call. If not, please mute yourself. Just do not uh, distract the speakers and everyone else. If possible, please keep your camera on so that we can have a more interactive experience. And uh, if you have any questions to the speakers, please use the raise uh, hand feature at the end of the call, or you can type your questions in the chat and I will voice them at the end of the talk. Um, just uh, a quick, uh, 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 just to update you on what today's agenda is. Uh, first of all, my name is Alex Spinov. I'm a senior data research scientist at the Center of Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics here. And today I'll be moderating this talk. We have, as I mentioned, two speakers. We have Mustafa Daldust from the University of Warsaw, and then uh, who is an early career researcher. And then we have Michael Tomasello from Duke University, who will give us a uh, really interesting talk today. And at the end of the talk, we'll have a Q and A. Um, if you're not familiar with our center, we are a research center at the University of Pennsylvania, enabling organizations around the world to sustainably enact positive behavioral change through specialized consulting, research, and training. And please uh, feel free to explore our website where you can find more about our work, what we're doing, and what we've done around the world. Um, uh, our talks uh, we have one more talk this academic year with Jana Freund uh, on June 6th, and then we'll resume uh, in September 2024 for the next academic year. Uh, we have roughly one talk per month, and uh, please uh, write down the dates or uh, use the URL to uh, have access to the information about the talks. Uh, again, a few ground rules, please mute yourself. Uh, please keep your camera on if possible. I understand not everyone can do that, but if possible, please do that. It helps us have a more interactive experience. We all miss in-person talks. Uh, Zoom allows us to have a broader reach, but at the same time, we wanna have as interactive experience as possible. Uh, all of the recordings uh, of our talks are posted online. Feel free to follow the link provided. Uh, and you'll be able to see this talk in a few days and all the previous talks that we had. Okay, and we'll start with our early career researcher, Mustafa Daldust, who's a researcher specializing in behavioral economics and interdisciplinary studies. He has a track record of applying economic theories to a uh, practical context. Uh, uh, Mustafa Daldust has a PhD in quantitative psychology and economics with a specific focus on neuropsychological aspects of decision making. Uh, his research interests include behavioral and experimental economics, cognitive economics, neuroeconomics, and decision making techniques. Uh, and today he will present his work on exploring the neuropsychological basis of social contagion uh, with evidence from an ERP study. And I'm gonna share, uh, stop sharing my screen. And Mustafa, uh, you, uh, the floor is all yours. And just uh, make sure you're unmuted. So can you hear me and see my slides? Yes. Okay, cool. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, the contagion and conformity issue uh, has been significant throughout history and famous people have already spoken to this. For instance, John Locke Code, emphasizing that the influence of the other on shaping or moral character. Similarly, David Hume acknowledged the contagion of passion further emphasizing the impact of social influence on our emotion and behavior. The title of my presentation is the 
exploring neuropsychological basis of social contagion evidence from an event-related potential study. Well, understanding of how people behave and make decisions within a society is highly complex process. And such process can be described as a nonlinear, dynamic, unpredictable, and multidimensional issue. Social influence is an example of such complexity because of, of social interaction or decision-making is heavily shaped by this interaction. Conformity and contagion that we used it here in this research interchangeably are two forms of social influence that promote the imitation of the beliefs, feeling, values, and behavior with the opinion of others. Imitation extended beyond human beings and animals, and recent studies in 2024 revealed that in brain cancer, glioblastoma, malignant cells have demonstrated ability to mimic normal brain cells. So, thereby they conferring resistance to conventional therapy intervention. So I'm not doing literature review here because that would take too long. So due to the time limitation, let me jump into the experimental paradigm. The experimental task consists of three sessions and social preferences will be measured in money allocation tasks. In the first session, the participant as a proposer in mini dictator game repeatedly will be asked to make a forced choices between two options. This session is referred as a self-trial and depicted with the orange color. Then in the phase two or session two, he or she just observed confederate proposal. We call it observe. Actually, computer algorithms were designed to generate observable choice based on the Fehrschmidt parameter estimation in phase one. In session three or phase three is mix part one and two, include both self trials and observable types. In all three sessions, the EEG signals were recorded simultaneously. Continuous EEG data was recorded from the scalp using 64 channels. Sampling rate was 250 Hertz and the impedance of the all recorded site was less than five kilo O throughout the Experiment. I did this, this experiment in the lab in the, during the COVID. That's why I wear the mask here. Let me a little bit talk about the allocation task in the experiment. We consider the effect of the contagion behavior on individual proposal by conducting a considerable number of money allocation tasks in different sessions. So X axis here represent the dictator payoff and Y axis depict the other payoff. Above 45 degree line represent the disadvantages area and below 45 degree line represent the advantages area. So the vertical lines here means that payoff for recipient can be increased or decreased at no cost for the dictator. So in this case, not giving may be interpreted as an end. And a positive slope here means that giving is beneficial both to recipient and to the dictator. So not giving may be evidence of the spiteful situations. We formulated the following research hypothesis. The degree of the behavioral similarity between subject and observed individual confederate will be greater after manipulation compared to the before manipulation, suggesting the occurrence of the contagion. Cognitive science literature show that category similarity and decision difficulty are cognitive processes that share similar neural mechanism with conformity. This is because individuals who align their decision with the others experience less difficulty is making in making decisions. From the electropsychological perspective, the presence of the P300 and LPP components, which is the, stands for the late positive potential, can provide com support for decision-making theories, such as categorization theory. Studies have shown that the amplitude of this component is negatively related to difficulty of the decision-making. So we can reach to the second hypothesis. Individual who conform, similar to the effect of the category similarities, will show higher LPP and P3 amplitude compared to those who don't conform. And finally, individuals who exhibit conformist behavior, similar to the effect of decision difficulty, will exhibit greater amplitude of either P300 or LPP compared to those who don't conform. 
Let's take a look at the result. This graph shows the decision similarity in phase one and phase three, and the horizontal axis represents the number of the similarity of subject decision with confederating phase one, and the vertical axis represents the number of the decision similarity in phase three. So it's expected that if contagion is to occur, more trial will be located above 45 degree lines. As can see from this graph, the phenomena of contagion has occurred for significant number of the participants. And this, time, this table shows the reaction time in phase one and phase three. So as you can see, response time were significantly shorter in phase three compared to the phase one. And mean reaction time for contagion group in phase three slightly shorter than for the non-contagion group. For the time window of the 200 to 350 uh, milliseconds that we expect to see P300 component, repeated measure three-way ANOVA revealed the significant effect of the three factors, contagion, phase, and channel on ERP amplitude. Also significant interaction effect between contagion and phase. For the, this time, time window, 200 to 350 milliseconds, we segmented brain into nine regions of the interest. And ERP differences between two experimental conditions, which means phase one and phase two, phase three, were then analyzed and compared for each of region of interest and electro separate. Three regions were found to be significant. However, after conducting post hoc analysis, which was false discovery rate correction test, two regions of interest, which was midline posterior and right posterior, indicating that these differences were statistically significant. And Cohen D and He G, suggesting that these differences are meaningful and not simply by chance. And this graph shows the grand average differences ERP waveform for contagion and not contagion in different phases in midline and the right posterior. This topo plot or sculpt maps support that, no, uh, that tempo parietal and parietal occipital region of the brain play a crucial role in processing information, particularly with respect to conformity and other regarding information. And so you can see the mean P P300 amplitude in tempo parietal and parietal occipital regions are, are uh, greater in the, after the manipulation. This is a, a red uh, signals. To determine whether individual's behavior change are manifested in brain activity, we conducted a Spearman correlation between amplitude and reaction time in ERP data, both across all subjects and among those who experience the contagion. As we can see from figure A, significant inverse relationship was observed between two variables, suggesting that amplitude increased, reaction time decreased. And this negative correlation was stronger among uh, individual who conform than the correlation coefficient for all subjects. However, an inverse relationship between two variables was not observed in not conform subject. Let me conclude. Human attitude and preferences are susceptible to social influence, which contradict with the axiom of orthodox economics. Reaction time provide useful information about individual utilities, often neglected in mainstream economy. Contagion impacted the participant preferences, leading to change in their choices. And observing other behavior will increase amplitude of the P300 component in the midline and right posterior region. And finally, the absence of the late positive potential, LPP, in the time window of 500 to 600 milliseconds suggests that presence of this P300 in this experiment may indicate difficulty in making decision. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Mustafa. It was really interesting. I myself have a few questions that I'll probably ask you after this talk. I'm wondering if it's possible for you to share your contact info in the chat box with us so that if people have any questions, they can reach out to you. And uh, on that note, we'll proceed to our main speaker today, who is uh, Professor Michael Tomasello, 
who will give us a talk about children's developing understanding of social norms. Uh, professor Tomasello is professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke University and emeritus director at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. His research interests focus on processes of cooperation, communication, and cultural learning in human children and great apes. His recent books include Origins of Human Communication, Why We Cooperate, A Natural History of Human Thinking, A Natural History of Human Morality, uh, Becoming Human, A Theory of uh, ont Ontogeny, and The Evolution of Agency. Uh, we're very uh, happy to have Michael Tomasello with us today. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I will just pass uh, the word to M. Uh, just one second. Okay, Michael, you are uh, welcome to share this. And you're still muted. Sorry, forgot to unmute. Um, okay, I'm gonna, my title is a little bit broader than uh, what I um, uh, originally submitted. And that's because I want to talk about the origin of uh, children's understanding and um, following and enforcing and creating social norms. But I want to take a step back and I want to think about it from uh, an evolutionary point of view first. Uh, I did want to share this. Um, uh, uh, I, somebody else uh, <clears throat> showed this on one of their screens and I stole it from them. But this is a restaurant in Southern California named Norms. And, and I, I want you to notice that uh, it says, we never close. <laughs> so I always thought that was a pretty, uh, <clears throat> pretty good summary of uh, social norms in society. They never close. Uh, okay, so my question, and I'm going to get to the ontogeny part of it about halfway through. or so, Well, I'm, I'll get to it right away, but to get to the social norms part of it about halfway through. Because I think to understand where social norms come from, we actually have to understand uh, the sort of normative attitudes more generally, normative cognition and attitudes more generally, and social norms are then um, uh, uh, arise in that context. So let's first ask the question, why are only humans moral creatures? And I'm taking socio-moral normativity as the key here. I understand that there are aspects of norm normativity that you wouldn't consider moral, but I want to take moral normativity as the kind of prototype so the proposal is that human normative thinking and attitudes represent psychological adaptations, evolutionary adaptations, for aligning, coordinating, and negotiating one's actions, thoughts, and attitudes with others within shared agencies. And the shared agencies is going to be the key term here. It's not just cooperation in general, but it's a particular kind of, cooperative, um, uh, of cooperation where we form a shared agency and we are pursuing a goal together. And this is going to come in two parts. One is the joint agency with a cooperative partner, which I have proposed uh, is comes first in evolution and ontogeny. And then the notion of collective agencies, where we are doing things together as a group and we are making group decisions and so forth. And that's where you get social norms more narrowly defined. In the joint agency for cooperative partners, we develop normative attitudes, but um, not group-wide social norms. Um, okay, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so here is where it starts, in my view, uh, and why other creatures don't have norms, because they don't do things like this. So this, is a, this actually is a pilot subject from a study on helping. And so you will see that um, helping going on here. But you're also going to see a couple of things that are going to change together. So you're trying to, well, this is all in German, but you don't really need to worry about that. Okay, now watch, watch what the kid does. He not only helps open it, but he also says, and you see the quick point, they go there. So he is telling him how to play his role in this collaborative activity. They're doing this together. And he needs to be in space when he does it. It's just super. Right. 
And now they're not going to watch. Now he doesn't wait for him to have a problem. He does his role in the activity in, in an anticipatory way. And again, tell points and tell him that you go there. So to me, this is the prototype of the situation. I would say that what you have here, and this is only an 18 month old child, mostly pre linguistic, is you know, I have up top there individual role ideals. They both, they each know what their roles are. They both know together what each of their roles are and how to play the other role. They can reverse roles. We have studies showing children can reverse roles. And you're going to see in a minute, if you don't play your role the right way, uh, they're going to tell you how to play it. That's what he does when he's pointing. And you'll see in a little bit, uh, they'll do some other things too, if you don't play your role the right way. So this is a kind of instrumental normativity where we have role ideals that we share. We know that whoever's playing this role needs to play it this way, and whoever is um, playing the other role has to play it this way for us to be jointly successful. And the point is, from an evolutionary point of view, other creatures don't join together and collaborate in that way where they have a shared agency. So here's a... Um, uh, a chimp, it's not exactly the same situation, but um, uh, you'll see that when she stops doing what she's doing, um, instead of trying to get her to do her job or something, he, the chimp just gets frustrated and tries to push her out of the way. So unlike the coordination you just saw where he tells the other one what to do, she's just ignoring the partner if the partner's not doing her job. All right and 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 uh, all right and they're not engaging in the same way. So here's another one. These children are a little bit older. These are three year old children, and they have a task. And we now have an experimental intervention. Now what I showed you there was just some sort of natural stuff. This is now they are going to pull up this stick together up the stairs, and one of them is going to get her reward first. Right? And the question is, if you really think of the, your partner as a kind of a social tool, when you get your reward, it should be over. Right? Now, look, the girl on the left is going to get her reward first because her hole is open. And we have blocked the hole of the girl on the right. So she can't really get hers at this early stage. Again, it's German, but there should be a... Yeah. So she's got hers in her hand and she has to go cash it in, but she's not cashing it in. She's go, she sees the other girl's problem. Whoops, your hole is closed. She shows her that her hole is higher up. And so she helps her with it. Now she can get hers and now watch they both. Bling, they both get to cash in their rewards. So the point is that for the child on the left, it doesn't matter that she got her reward already. The collaborative activity is not over yet. We are committed to doing it together. Now when I use the word commit, now we're edging toward normative. A, a, a commitment is a normative uh, agreement of some sort. And I have their chimps know because we have a study with chimpanzees where they are both sort of pulling. They just pull it from left to right and they pull it. And when, he, when the, one of them gets their reward first, it's over. He goes and runs away and cashes in his reward. It's a little token. He cashes in his reward, and um, that's it. So the chimpanzee is viewing this collaborative partner like a social tool. I know I need this partner. I can't get mine unless she pulls on her side also. But once they get the reward, it's over. The children are committed to doing it till the end until both get their rewards. Now, what happens if one of them doesn't play their role correctly? So here we have three-year-olds again, and you can see you heard the little pling before. This is what the pling was. This is our, our um, elephant uh, toy. And these kids have made a joint commitment, explicit joint commitment to play this game together. We say, you guys are going to play this together, okay? They say, okay, and then we have them do a high five to cement their joint commitment to playing this game together. Now, we have shown them each separately how to play the game, and the trick is the one on the right 
we told her to do something different. We told her the game is played a different way. And you see the girl on the left is perplexed and not happy that the other girl is not playing her role in the ideal way that they supposedly know together she should. And one of the keys is watching the normative language. So here she's just telling her what to do, do it up and down. One has to do it like this for you German speakers. Man muss. Man muss an Seil ziehen. Man muss an Seil ziehen. Okay, so this is the first normative language. I uh, We have... Um, <clears throat> Um, if they aren't collaborating, but they're playing side by side, there is no protest like this. The protest comes from the fact that we are interdependent. We depend on one another, and we know this. We know we have to both play our roles in the ideal way, or we're not going to be successful. But in addition to this instrumental normativity that we both need to play our roles to be successful, you have to play your you have to respect the fact that I am depending on you. And when you don't, I don't just say, I don't like it as my personal opinion. I say, you have to do this. I understand you could interpret the have to uh, in a kind of an instrumental way. For us to be successful, you have to. But you'll see other cases in a minute where that's not the case, where the have to means if we're going to do this together, you have to do it this way. And again, we have a control condition where there is no collaboration, where they each do their things separately. There's no joint commitment. Um, and there is uh, no protest, no normative protest. Uh, and now here's another case where it can't be about playing the role. It's about um, they are going to do this together and they have to pull in together again to get the reward. And it's going to be four gummy bears coming onto the floor. And they actually, they shouldn't be coming onto the floor. They pull too hard. They come onto the, floor. the little girl on the left takes all of them. And this is a protest. And she gives it up. In all the studies we've done, where we have three-year-olds and they have four gummy bears, if one of them takes more than half, which is rare, they usually take half each. If one of them takes more, the other one protests. This little girl didn't give a normative protest, but she says she wanted one too. And the other one gives it up. A lot of the kids, when they protest, they just say something like, I only got one, or I don't have any. And the other girl gives it up. That girl is not telling her what to do. She's just pointing out the situation that you got more than me and the girl um, makes things right. So I would say this is a, uh, and again, not if there's not collaboration, if they're doing things side by side and you get more than me, well, that's just luck. But if we're collaborating and we're interdependent and I depend on you for getting my rewards, then I can protest and I can protest normatively and you will accept it. And this is going to be one of the keys. This is why I show this video, because this girl accepts that it's a legitimate protest. I know I shouldn't have taken them all, she says. Okay, okay. Right? That's, the, that's the sort of normative component that comes in, that I feel some kind of responsibility or commitment or obligation to um, do my role in the activity and to share in mutually satisfactory ways, share fairly, um, uh, uh, as uh, on any um, spoils that are generated as a result of this collaboration. Here's another uh, phenomenon that, um, so what I've showed you so far is how they, the children work together. And if one of them uh, breaks the, um, doesn't play her role the right way, the other one objects. If they don't share the spoils at the end in, the, in, in, a, in a fair way, one of them objects. But uh, what I haven't shown you yet is what happens if the child wants to break her commitment. And this to me is extremely telling that we're not just talking about a preference for doing it together or something like that, a preference that you do your thing right. It's not just instrumental. This little girl, now watch the bottom two here. And again, it's going to be in German, but you will, um, you will see subtitles. She has, in the condition you're watching here, she has made a joint commitment to play this game together with the adult. They, they, you have to sort of orchestrate these things, but the adult says, let's play this together, okay? And the child says, okay. And they're only in the condition if they say explicitly say, okay. So they're jointly committed to play. Now in the right panel, another adult is gonna draw her away to a more fun activity and she's really wants to 
quit playing this boring activity that she committed to, and you'll see what she does. Oh, that's right. Oh, so she's not exactly polite, <laughs> a little abrupt, we should say, but what we find is that children that are three years of age and older, not two-year-old children, but children three years old and older, they will make an excuse or provide a justification before they leave. And this is a, it's a ubiquitous phenomenon. I would venture to say that you do this several times. Every one of us here does this several times a day, every day, where you're talking to somebody, you say, uh, okay, I got to go home now, or okay, now I've got something I've got to do. Or uh, even if you just say, okay, see you later, you're acknowledging that we are doing something together, even if it's just having a conversation and that I need to break it off, but I need to acknowledge that I'm breaking it off because this shows you respect that uh, I don't just, we can't say, let's go get a coffee together and start walking over toward the coffee shop. And I can't just turn around and walk the other direction. I could easily do that if I say, oh, sorry, I have, I just remembered I've got to go call home, then it's fine. But if I don't make an excuse, it's not fine. I'm breaking a commitment without acknowledging it. You have to acknowledge it. And ultimately, of course, in some cases, you need to apologize for breaking joint commit. Oh, I know I promised you, but I had something more important come up. And again, um, um, if there's no joint commitment, so the control condition is the adult, the child is playing the game and the adult comes up and starts playing it right beside her, kind of with her, but there's no commitment, let's play it together. The child does not make excuses and does not uh, justify her behavior. So, this working together collaboratively toward a joint goal and the most intense version of that is when we, we explicitly agree that we're doing it together, uh, then you have a different relationship between the partners than you do when you don't have that commitment and then, ch then chimps can ever do. Chimps can never have that kind of a shared goal, much less a joint commitment. Now, we don't see joint spontaneous joint commitments in young children that much. They quite often say, let's do something okay, uh, but, but um, more often they just start doing it. But here are some five-year-olds that we caught doing one that I think is really interesting. So this is a task where they have to pull together to one side, and then only I get a reward. But then if we pull to the other side, you get a reward and I don't get one. So it's, it's um, it, the solution is, of course, some kind of turn taking. We pull the your side first and you get a reward. And then we pull to my side and I get a reward. And you'll see these guys negotiating and they solve the negotiation. They solve the dilemma with a joint commitment. Uh, luckily, in German, the word for here is here, <laughs> but they're also subtitles. Okay, there it is. Okay, they couldn't decide which side to pull it to. Uh, and finally, the kid says, essentially, okay, we can go to your side first, but then here, then we have to go back to my side. Okay, okay, and now everything is fine. All right, so I've made a promise, I've made a commitment, um, and, uh, and so now we can get the turn taking going. Uh, by the way, with chimpanzees, we uh, did the same study. We had two or three different ways of trying to get it they can never get turn-taking going. And they can't get turn-taking going because they don't trust one another uh, to come to the other side once you went to one side. So they, the, 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 um, uh, the dominant chimp always wants to go to his side. And um, I'm going to skip this for time's sake. That's, a, that's just shine of guilt. I think that when I break a norm, if I legitimately feel that I should have, I, I break a commitment, I legitimately feel I shouldn't have, uh, then uh, I, I'll do it quickly. So this is a child who um, uh, the adult has told her, don't uh, let this block thing uh, happen, don't knock it down. And now you see surreptitiously she's opening this. And now, uh-oh. It's <laughs> kind all right. And so she says, it's broken. And she ends up saying, oh, it just came down to me. I didn't do it. So she's apologizing, making excuses. I didn't do it, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I think guilt is a real sign. And this guilt first emerges of this type at three years of age as well. So they all emerge, um, the, the really normative stuff emerges at three years of age. The collaboration with ideal roles, with telling the other one how to do their part and all of that, that's one to three years of age. But at three years of age, we get what I've called a normative turn. And so this is my sort of graphic depiction. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the second personal agent with a cooperative identity a little bit more in a minute. Right now, I just, just call them partners, two partners. We make a joint commitment to role ideals. We make a joint commitment to each play our role the way we know we should. And um, we, we self-regulate it. And this is my, um, my conceptualization of this is when I say, if you, if you don't play your role the correct way, and I say, um, I don't like it when you do that, or you're messing things up, right? that's a personal uh, opinion. But when I say, you have to do it this way, you're doing it wrong, uh, uh, then I am invoking something higher than my personal opinion. And that is the joint commitment that we originally made to do this together cooperatively. And so when you break your, um, when you're not playing your role the right way, or you're taking more of the spoils than you deserve, then I protest normatively, you shouldn't do that, you must do this, and you view it as legitimate. And that's why you say, oh, sorry, whoops, okay, and you correct yourself. Or if you want to opt out of your role, you make an excuse. So you make an excuse, or you self-correct, because you believe that my criticism of you is legitimate. Why is it legitimate? Because you agreed to it at the beginning. And this is the joint commitment. Um, and this makes us responsible to one another. I have that down at the bottom here. Responsible to one another um, uh, is another normative word, of course. And this responsibility is because we both know together in common ground that we are interdependent and we depend on one another and we make this commitment and this commitment sets up legitimate normative protests. So we have the right to protest our partner's failings and we entitle the partner to protest our failings. So if the partner protests against our failings, we, uh, if, if the partner protests against my failings, I feel it's a legitimate protest because I know I didn't do the right thing, all right? And I'm gonna come back to this in a moment, but the question is, well, why don't I just ignore you? You, you say, oh, you didn't, you know, you have to do it this way. You shouldn't do it like that. Why don't I just blow you off? Yeah, I prefer doing it this way. Well, because you're never going to cooperate with me again. And if you think evolutionarily in a situation where cooperation is key to survival, then um, uh, you and everybody else refusing to cooperate with me because I'm not being a cooperative partner, a good cooperative partner, that will mean death for me in, a, in, in evolutionary terms. So we are evolved to be sensitive to all these things, to be sensitive to the fact that others are depending on us and that we depend on others and that we're doing this together and that we can call each other out when it doesn't, uh, when we're not doing it right. And we have to submit to that calling out, uh, assuming that we've made a joint commitment of some kind, even implicit, um, if we want to retain our cooperative identity. And by that, I mean that people will see us as a cooperative person and want to cooperate with us in the future. Okay, now let me get to social norms per se. <laughs> so I know uh, the, the word uh, norm is used uh, really quite broadly, and people will talk about the children that I just showed you um, as following social norms. And that's a broader term, broader way of using it than I would. And actually, uh, I know that Christina Vicieri and a lot of her things, it's really a societal level thing, and that's the way I think about it. If you wanted to call this early thing social norms, you could, of course, but I'll just say it's a normative. It's, it's becoming a normative creature. And then at around three years of age, at the same time, they're starting to become normative in their collaboration with others and joint commitments. They start understanding societal level social norms. Now, the earliest manifestation of this is what a lot of the evolution people have called third party punishment or third party intervention. And so here's a study, here's a little study where uh, this child <clears throat> has seen this guy over here on the right playing a game that he calls daxing. And then the puppet comes in and plays the game the wrong way. 
Now, the key difference from the study, the things you saw before, is in this case, the child is not playing. The child is not dependent on this puppet for the game. The child is just observing. So this is third-party enforcement of, of the right way to play the game. All right? Now he's going to show him how to do it, show the puppet how to do it. So this is a third party enforcement of the social norm where the child is not affected at all. And, and again, it's just a game. So, it, you know, it's not going to affect the child if the puppet plays it the wrong way. Who cares? I care because I want you to play the game the right way. And now we get evolutionarily a little tricky. What's the motivation for this? Why are we enforcing social norms? We know why children are, generally speaking, why they're following social norms and why they're following, um, the, because as they're normative creatures, they're treating others with whom they're interdependent um, uh, normatively. I believe that at around age three, young children start to become group-minded, I've called it, and so they're actually thinking of everything people do in the group is relevant to everyone. So um, you're not following the rules, you're potentially disrupting uh, the group. I mean, the three-year-old's not thinking about that explicitly, but the adaptation is about doing things in the uh, group-accepted way of doing them. And so this child um, objects normatively, uh, third-party intervention to enforce the social norm. Uh, here's another version of the same thing. Uh, you don't need to know what the rules of this game are. You just need to know what this thing no. is not involved. This is third party. Now we have the, have the right and wrong. Oh, <laughs> He's cheated. <laughs> she, she's supposed to be quiet. So he's very upset and persistent. Uh, that um, uh, the guy's not playing the game the right way. So this, again, third-party intervention. I'm just going to give you one more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, here's an interesting variation. So, so, so the interesting question about the third party, I, I will have to say that uh, I sort of stumbled upon this um, uh, um, accidentally, I mean, not really. We were we were sort of studying children's understanding game rules, and if they sort of thought of everybody has to play the rule by the rules the same way, and these kids started this not just enforcing, but norm using normative language. You have to do it this way. This is the right and wrong way to do it, and the kids weren't even involved. Why why did they care how somebody was doing in a third party? So. We started seeing all this and and just really uh, uh, thought it was very significant and had done a lot of things with it after that. So here's a here's another version. I mean, a variation on the theme. So the child watches. This is just a picture. It's not a video. The child watches on a laptop um, while um, the villain on the right, the villain. Uh, ruins the little clay thing of the victim or tears up a picture of the victim or does something bad to the victim. And now what is varied is the girl you see here that is labeled as enforcer, she either enforces the norm uh, by saying, that was, her, that was her picture. You shouldn't have done that. And she says it kind of harshly and sharply. And in some other children, they get this third party just watching and going, okay. So they don't enforce the norm. And children, then we ask children, 
Who do you like more? Who do you want to play with? Who could you imagine being your friend? Who would you like to invite for a play date? And it's quite clear the children prefer the enforcer. And this is odd. I have written up in the top here, even though the enforcer is acting more harshly. The enforcer, we wanted the enforcer to be kind of mean. You shouldn't do that. Right? And the non-enforcer is very pleasant. But the children are choosing as a friend and a playmate someone who's being harsh uh, over being friendly because she is enforcing a norm. And as we all know, um, uh, moral norms uh, apply at a second order level. So um, if if uh, if you say, well, you know, I never murdered anyone, but if other people want to murder other people, well, that's you know, I don't care, whatever. That's not moral. Okay, I have my morality extends to saying that not only do I not murder other people, but I don't think it's right if third parties murder other people either. So these children are morally judging someone who enforces norms more positively than someone who does not enforce uh, norms. And these are, again, these are moral norms in this case, in the sense that the victim is harmed. Um, and I just want to show you, uh, here's a case where uh, there's something pretty interesting with young children. These are three-year-olds also, and each of them has been taught a different rule. So everything you've seen so far has been with adults and the adults sort of uh, have established the rules. And you can imagine that children are um, giving norms their force by attributing it to adults. And these are adult rules. Adults are the ones who run the world here. So um, they have force for that reason. But even when they're doing it with peers, so watch, uh, this is German and I don't think it has subtitles, but they're talking about one of them is to, learns that the game is you put animals on animals, and the other one is you put colors on colors, and you'll hear them talking about Inta, which is a hedgehog, and, and uh, sorry, um, Inta, which is a duck, and Eagle, which is a hedgehog, and you'll see them arguing about it, and they'll also use a little normative language. Yes, like to eagle, like hedgehog to hedgehog. Oh. oh, that means yes, not yes. <laughs> no, that's a duck. <laughs> that's a snake. That doesn't go like that. Eagle to eagle. Eagle to eagle. Eagle to eagle. Eat so. In English, German, good so is a very common expression. It goes like this. Eat so. It goes like this. Right? So even with one another, where they're, all right, this is what they're doing. Now, the, the adults did actually give them the rules earlier. Sorry, I just want to say some people have claimed in the literature that um, third party enforcement of social norms is not um, uh, uh, take place in all cultures. I don't believe that's the case. I believe it does. But in some cultures, it's not actual third party intervention. It's gossiping uh, behind the back. Uh, so somebody does breaks a norm and you tell all your friends they did. So it's not intervention directly, but it's third party punishment in the sense of gossiping behind their back. Uh, and so what we did was a, a study with children um, where that's probably not much of an issue the same way the, with adults, you don't want to intervene because it could get you into trouble. Uh, and here are some, a very wide range of cultural groups, some of them from Africa, some of them from South America, um, uh, some of them rural, some of them urban, um, but most of them non-literate. Certainly all the, um, all the non-urban ones are non-literate, and we get exactly the same thing. So this is a uh, they watch a child that, and they learn that the rules are that you put the same color on the same peg or you put the same shape on the same peg. And when the other child plays it wrong, in all cultures, they intervene and say, no, 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 it doesn't go like that. And they often use the word right and wrong. You're doing it wrong. Finally, I want to um, turn to a phenomenon that I think is of great um, interest and importance and that has only been studied a little bit. And that is children creating their own social norms. So this tells you that we don't have to have adults, that this the power of norms is not coming from adults. It's coming from the agreement. 
Now, in this case, it's really about five-year-olds before we see it clearly. Um, we see a couple of hints in three-year-olds, but really not clearly in, in five-year-olds. So uh, this is actually just, um, I'm just going to show you the kind of way we do this. And these are three children, and they come in. And this and adult says, I don't know what this game is. I don't know how I spread it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know anything about it. Whoops. And I all I wanna all I wanna um yeah. I mean, is that um these kids start doing things and they come up with their own way of doing it. They make up their own rules. You have to and, and here's the key. So after they've made up their own rules. <clears throat> Each one of them individually now is goes in the room with two novices, two kids who have never played this game before, and they immediately adopt the normative language. You have to do it like this. You, you can't do that. You have to do this. And they, they the, the one who knows how to play the game, where they made up the rules themselves, just the three children, uh, now enforce it, the rules normatively on novice children. So... Um, the normativity for these five-year-olds is not coming from adults. It's coming from the fact of agreement itself. Um, here's a third-party version of this. The child watches this scene in front of you. Uh, the, the, I saw you can see the child here. The child is watching. Uh, there are these puppets who go around doing things. And basically, um, uh, um, they're agreeing to a rule. And then one of them does it differently. And... The child, uh, the, the child protests normatively if one of the guys who has agreed to the rule deviates, but they don't protest if the individual never signed on or left the scene first or something like that. And it has to, it, 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 unanimously is a really interesting part of this. They, they only see the norm as being formed if everyone agrees. But if let's say all of these people here agree. So you see a proposer who says, let's play it this way. A firmer one says, okay, let's play it this way. A firmer two says, let's play it this way. And then uh, the bunny plays it the wrong way, the child protests. Okay, no, 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 that's not the way to play. If the protagonist has left the room when they made the rule and come back, the, the child doesn't hold the protagonist to it because he didn't know the rule. And, uh, uh, and if the protagonist said, no, I think I won't play it if we play it that way, again, the child doesn't hold them to it. So the key is agreement. Uh, they have to, if any, everyone who signs on to the rule uh, has to abide by it, and if not, not. And again, there are no adults in this context. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip that one. And one last little um, study here. And this is a study where um, we have children groups. This is a little bit more like society, I would say. Um, the children, we have four children. And these four children are playing with these two trains. And it's actually a chicken game, a game, a game, uh, game theory chicken game. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the two trains come to something where they have to decide how to resolve, uh, how to resolve the potential crash. Um, and, uh, and all four of them together agree the big train goes first or the oldest child goes first or whatever. Um, and then only two of them play together at a time. And the other two are not there. And so the two agree, the two end up following the rules that all four of them agreed to. So this is kind of a little bit more like a real social norm in a real society where we all agree to these rules. And then no matter who is interacting, if even if it's just two of us, um, we have to do it by the rules that all of us agreed to. So I kind of see my sort of graphic depiction here is similar to the one I had before with the joint commitment, but the but the here we have a cultural we, a collective commitment to social norms. We legitimately self-regulate each of us in our cooperative identity. We each have to follow it or we lose our cooperative identity. The child, anyone who is always breaking the rules gets ostracized. You have to follow the rules at least to some degree. So if you're in a peer group and you always take everything for yourself or you never um, do things the way other people do them, you won't be in that group very long. Um, so it's it, again, it's your it's your um, cultural identity or your group identity, I should say. And again, we have the right to protest our compatriots' failings, and we entitle them to protest our failings. Uh, and if I refuse to cooperate, I lose my cultural or moral identity. 
So overall, in my book on the um, the uh, natural history of human morality, I just put this kind of um, quickie little formula here uh, that if we think of morality in general, socio-moral way of viewing the world, um, normative way of viewing the world, moral normativity way of viewing the world, you over me is sympathy and helping. So uh, all of this is about things that are not being selfish. How are, in what ways are we not selfish? One is I put your interests over mine and I have sympathy for your plight and I help you. That's you over me. You equals me is equality and fairness and we over me is the either the collaborative partner or the cultural group. We agreed to do something a certain way, either in a joint commitment or by being members of a cultural group in which there's a certain rule. And we regulate me. So we think of social norms as uh, being the, the group regulation of individual behavior. And if we internalize that, uh, then it comes with obligation and a feeling a feeling of normative obligation. Um, this is very speculative, but I've always kind of liked the idea. Uh, Christine Kursgaard, in her book all the way back from 1996, says that an obligation always takes the form of a reaction against the threat of a loss of identity. And that's exactly what I'm talking about here, is that if I uh, continuously don't cooperate, I will lose my cooperative identity. I won't be uh, my cultural identity. I'm not one of us. If everything I do is non-conforming and non-helpful and non-cooperative, then uh, I'm going to lose my identity in the group. And by identity, I just mean that everyone perceives me as a cooperative member of this uh, group. Um, okay, so to bring it all together, I would say that the collaborative we meaning the two of us working together collaboratively, and the in-group we, meaning the whole group of us that consider ourselves a we, are the natural homes of normative obligation. If you were somehow you know, um, uh, wandering around and run into another being somewhere, uh, you don't really think of that as having obligations other than some, you know, obligation to humanity. We have obligations to people that we are interdependent with. We are collaborating with them. We're in the same group. And we all know that there's parochialism, in-group favoritism, and all kinds of normative judgments. Um, and the two components of this are a we over me self-regulation and equal respect. And they go together because the reason the we over me self-regulation works is because I recognize that other people are legitimate they have their concerns that are legitimately as valuable as my concerns. And so I have to take into account their concerns also, and I'm part of the group. So I wanna emphasize what's unique about this little formulation of we over me is it is not the case. I would say that if, we, if a lot of people look at the evolution of morality and normativity, uh, wanna put it in terms of reputation, that I am conforming to the group and I'm behaving morally because I want to keep my reputation. I would characterize that as I'm worried about they regulating me. That's not it. What this is, is I'm a member of the group that thinks this is wrong also. Okay. I had a, I had a weak moment here and I broke the rules or I stole from you or I didn't play my part. And I believe I was wrong. Right. So, because I am part of the group that agreed that this is wrong and it applies to me as well as it applies to other people. And that's why I have equal respect. Each of us, is subject to this judgment uh, equally to all others. So that's where I think the legitimacy of the normative judgment comes from um, is that I'm part of the group that made it up and I agreed to it. And so it applies to everyone, including myself. And it's tied to my identity in the sense of, of course, I can ignore all this. But if I ignore it, then, you know, I'm not going to be uh, seen as a cooperative person uh, in my partnership or my group. Uh, and the, this paper I cited at the bottom, the Behavior and Brain Sciences paper on the moral psychology of obligation, um, um, I actually show, um, try to um, show a, a lot of data showing that only when you're interdependent with somebody in a partnership or a group uh, do you uh, show this kind of normative attitude. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was uh, very interesting. We are now... Uh, opening the floor for questions. And I see there's a question by Masood. So if you can unmute yourself uh, and ask the question, that would be great. 
Uh, I, I want to unshare my thing here uh, and oh, stop share. There it is. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mike. That was that was really fascinating. So um, I'm going to look at the findings that you presented from a sociological perspective because I'm a sociologist by discipline. And much of what I heard you say is largely the result of us being uh, fearful of sanctioning mechanisms. So we cooperate because we're afraid of consequences and the sanctions. Um, but but the legitimate sanctions. <laughs> legitimate sanctions. Uh, but then can I also say that like we cooperate because, I mean, you made an evolutionary argument. You said that um, we do this because from an evolutionary perspective, we have always depended on each other and that's why we cooperate and uh, chimpanzees don't do this because they haven't. So is this, so the difference between us and them when it comes to cooperation. So I'm, I'm taking a step back. The reason we opt to cooperate, right? Is it primarily as you seem to suggest, is it, is it an evolutionary uh, uh, dimension to this that we have to depend on each other, but then chimps, I mean, I could I could imagine that chimps also had to depend on each other to survive. They, they do to, they do to some degree, but we do much more in much more concrete ways. So they basically they forage in little parties, but then everybody just gets grabs what they want when the food comes. In humans, we do it together and we share the spoils of it. So we have a collaborative foraging where we have. And I did want to, when you were saying that cooperating to, for fear of sanctions, I didn't emphasize it, but thank you for pointing that out. Uh, it's, it actually starts with the benefit, okay, that, that we're generating resources that neither could do alone. So collaboration generates resources that we couldn't have alone, and we get to choose our partners. We have partner choice. And so anybody who's not good at that gets excluded from the game. So I'm sorry, thank you for bringing that up. I didn't emphasize that it gives you benefits. Cooperation gives you benefits that non-cooperation does not. And if you're not doing it the right way, you get excluded. And that's where the sanctions come, is that you get excluded if you don't do it the right way. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so, Claudia Hovell is asking if you can expand the idea of social tools. And Claudia, if you want to elaborate on the question, uh, you're free to unmute also. Uh, I'm not monitoring the chat, so. Yeah, so I'm just. Uh, okay. I'm. I guess, I guess uh, she just wants to know more about social tools. Yes, uh, so that's, a, um, I, I sort of, I think I invented that term because um, uh, the chimps do collaborate some. So, um, uh, Masood, you were right. They, they do collaborate some, and they do depend on one another some, but only a little. <laughs> and mainly, they know they need the partner, and so we set up a situation like that pulling in together, and they know they need the partner because the, 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 the apparatus is such that if you pull yourself, you get nothing. You, you, the rope comes through, it's sort of strung through these things. So they know they need the partner, but as soon as they get their reward, they're done with the partner. Okay, <laughs> so, the part, so, so I, I coined the term social tool to, um, uh, uh, we, and we humans use others as social tools all the time, right? That was, uh, that was uh, I think that's one of Kant's uh, credit, uh, criteria for being a moral creature is that you don't just use others as means to ends, as social tools. Um, and so, um, yes, we do that too. And, and that's, uh, uh, we all know people that are always using other people as social tools and we don't like them. So yes, we do that too. But uh, we also uh, feel a sense of legitimacy um, for um, certain following our expected uh, role in a collaboration and we feel guilty if I, I really think guilt is one of the key things here, we feel genuinely guilty. Uh, the difference between fe some people may argue about this because the words are used in a lot of ways, but in some uses of the words, I think shame. I'm ashamed if people find out about this. I'm ashamed if people found out I grew up in a poor home and I whatever. But I don't feel guilty that I grew up in a poor home. I just feel ashamed that people would know about. It. I don't want them to think badly of me. 
but I feel guilty uh, even when nobody knows about it. Um, uh, I feel guilty if I did something wrong, even if nobody's going to find out about it, because I legitimately feel like I shouldn't have done that. So anyway, to me, that's the difference between a social tool and a truly collaborative partner is a collaborative partner and I are committed to uh, doing whatever is necessary to keep up the cooperation. And we both feel that we legitimately should do that. And if we get sanctioned for not doing it, we feel like we deserve it. Uh, thank you. And uh, to follow up on that, so at what age do children develop the understanding of those social tools? Um, of which? At, at what age do children become aware of social tools? Social tools? Yeah. Well, they can use others as social tools from quite early. <laughs> they cry and whine and get their parents to do things for them all the time, right? Uh, I, I often talk about, uh, you know, whining as kind of like a threat to cry, you know, do what I want or I'm going to really let loose here. So they're using others as social tools from pretty much as early as they're social. But when do they see others as truly collaborative partners and social partners? I would say that's um, in the, uh, at the very, the very beginning is I showed you some kids that were 18 months old. Uh, so somewhere around there, they're doing something that I would consider really collaborative. And I've called age three the normative turn. And that's because that's the age at which they first actually use normative language and they sanction others for, for not doing their role the right way. Uh, before that, they do things like encourage the other to play their role. If the other quits playing their role, they say, come on back or whatever. Right. So there, there is something there. They know about a collaborative partner and and. and and they communicate to try to coordinate the collaboration. But age three is where they really start. Uh, it's the first time you can see guilt. It's the first time you can see normative protests. It's the first time you see them making excuses and justifications. So for sure, whatever, however you might want to characterize before age three, at age three, for sure, it's explicit normativity, where you can even see it in their uh, behavior and language um, in in various in variations on the collaborative situation and the the rule breaking situation. Thank you. And uh, I have a question myself about the design of the experiments that you uh, presented. So how were the instructions given to the children? Because I was thinking the different that like you were contrasting uh, human children with apes. And uh, like my understanding is you cannot really give language instructions to uh, the apes. So no, exactly. how does this play a role in so the- th This is, um, you can't really do the joint commitment with apes because they have to, you have to have some kind of communication to have a joint commitment. But they do learn that they, uh, they have a kind of a warm up period and they learn that they can only pull in for mutual benefit if the other guy pulls at the same time. And so um, uh, that's the best we can do. And once the children, once they're doing that, they already uh, stop and help the other guy if he doesn't uh, do it right. And if they, if even without the joint uh, commitment, if they have a certain, we have a study showing implicit commitment, we both look at one another and we both, you know, like, uh, then they also can normatively protest. But you're absolutely right. It's not a perfect comparison with the apes because, uh, because of the language dimension. That's absolutely true. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jordan Wiley is asking a question about uh, the cultural aspects of your experiments. So your experiments were conducted in Germany. Uh, would you expect the results to be uh, the same in any other culture? Uh, in Europe, if I talk about this, a lot of people, you know, there's all these cultural stereotypes from one culture to the other. And the people say, oh, that's Germans. They're so pro-social, <laughs> so pro-social and rule following. Uh, yes, but that's why I showed the one slide of cross-culturally of the children when they see someone breaking rules that they do intervene. Um, and we have uh, one published study uh, in a collaboration situation where the person doesn't play their role the right way and they intervene. So this is still, this work is still in its infancy and other people are doing it uh, in addition to our group. But um, um, I, my, my, take at this point is that it may look pretty different in different cultures. And I mentioned before, there's some cultures where they don't really intervene third party very often. They tend to see somebody do something that they're not supposed to do and they kind of withdraw, but then they gossip about it. So that's so, and it may be that our young children may manifest it in some different ways, but I believe all of them, uh, the evidence we have so far suggests that all of them do have some normative sense of, um, you know, the, the right and wrong way to do things, uh, uh, either in a collaboration or a group setting. 
Thank you. Uh, Guan Yu Yo Yo Wu from Australia is asking uh, about your opinion about the role of language in general in social norms. Like, to what extent social norms are like shaped by the fact that humans have this like innate ability of having language? Um, um, language certainly helps. There's no question about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I I tend in general to um, never attribute a lot of magical powers to language. I always think of language as conventionalizing things that are already there somehow. So we have a lot of social norms that we don't break that nobody ever told us. Um, I, I was just in a, in, a, in a class the other day and somebody was saying, well, you know, when you see the president of the university, you call him Mr. So-and-so. You don't call him by his first name. Nobody ever told me that. Nobody ever told me not to do that. I just sort of... You know, and maybe I'm generalizing from other things, but I, you know, we, how far away you stand to people when you talk, that varies across cultures and children, nobody tells them stand certain length away from somebody. So I tend to think of social norms as a, the common ground understanding of how we do things in this group. And the best way of formulating those with language, because in language, they get out there in public and then you can't deny knowing them. This is one of the things that one of the points that um, Philip Pettit makes in his lectures on moral normativity is um, that what when things are made explicit, you lose the excuse to say, I didn't know. So let's say there's a norm in our culture that, um, you know, that I don't stand too close to you when I talk. And then I come up and stand right next to you and say, geez, man, that bothers me. And I say, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that. I can I can claim ignorance and get away with it. But if it's out there in the open, and it's explicated in language that we don't do this kind of thing, then I lose the excuse of, oh, I didn't know. So um, I think language especially helps cement uh, the, uh, the the social norm by making it public uh, in a way that um, more implicit social norms uh, are, are a little bit less uh, strong precisely because they're not as um, public. Thank you very much. So we're running out of time. Uh, so I guess if anyone has any more questions, we'll post the contact info of the speakers and you're uh, free to contact. Yes, I, I, as far, I don't really deal with the chat very much. So I don't know what's going on in the chat. And, and if somebody poses a question in the chat, I'm not going to see it because when I log off, it's gone. But I'm happy that if somebody wants to email me, I'm very happy to um, discuss it on an email. And on that note, I just want to remind everyone that our next talk is on June 6, 2024. We'll have Jana Foint from Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts. We'll post the talk details in the abstract as soon as we have them. And with that said, thank you very much for joining our talk today. And we thank hope you. to see you again soon.